the Bowie knife, the legendary weapon of the American frontier. Today, we will be looking at what exactly a Bowie is, why it's designed the way it is, and how it shaped history. The answers may surprise you. The Bowie Knife, blade of notorious repute and scourge of the American frontier. Perhaps only the Colt revolver better evokes the imagination of the Old West. But what exactly is a Bowie Knife? Is this a Bowie Knife? Is this one? What about this? Depending upon who you talk to, all three of these blades are considered Bowie Knives. One school of thought is that a Bowie is a large blade with a guard and a beveled back clip. Another definition is simply a large blade with a back edge, whether it has a back clip or not. The loosest definition is just a large American blade. So which one is correct? The short answer is all of the above. If you look at historical accounts, you will quickly notice that pretty much every large blade is called a Bowie knife. Those who train to fight with the Bowie make extensive use of back cuts and thus they require that back edge. The clipped back edge today is the most recognizable Bowie, likely due to the book American Knives that claimed in 1958 that the clipped Bowie was the most pure form of the Bowie knife. Many purists will claim that a clipped Bowie is the only real Bowie. I personally consider a Bowie to be any large blade with a back edge. A Bowie should be able to perform a back cut. Now why would these knives exist? The Bowie originated during the time of muzzle-loading firearms and when swordplay was still an excellent skill to have. Flintlock muskets were the height of weapons technology. A rifle or a pistol afforded you only one shot and that shot had a relatively high chance of misfiring. If your shot didn't go off, missed, or it didn't stop your target, you had to resort to a little bit more medieval means of dealing with it. For soldiers, that meant the socket bayonet or sword. For the frontiersmen, the more practical bowie knife evolved. A blade capable of efficiently dispatching an enemy or field dressing a deer for dinner. A well-made bowie makes for an excellent fighting knife. James Keating described the bowie to me as a knife meant to break other knives. Upon inspection, you will find that bowies are thicker than most other knives. The spine of a bowie can often be measured up to a quarter of an inch thick and the length of a bowie increases its owner's reach significantly. Combining these two factors together, the weight of a bowie combined with its mass means that the belly of a bowie has a significant amount of momentum when it hits, essentially acting like a meat cleaver. Bowie fighting systems make use of this quality to break with other knife systems and actively target bones. A cut to the back of the hand can break the metacarpals. Thrusts to the sternum are used to drive back attackers. A hit to the head can instantly end a fight. In spite of this, a properly balanced bowie is surprisingly nimble and agile, comparable to a longsword. The blade can quickly be recovered or diverted from cuts and thrusts and used for parries and counters. But what about the back edge? Why is it so important to the bowie knife? There are a couple of reasons. The first is reach. If you make a normal cut, your blade will reach out to a certain maximum point. If you then make a back cut, you'll notice that you are able to reach out further on your cuts. The second reason is where we see why clipped bowies are considered superior to drop point bowies. The back cut from a clip point bowie is more aggressive than a normal cut. The reason why is that the blade geometry completely changes with a back cut. If you look at this bowie knife, you can see that the primary edge is a pretty standard trailing point. The second I turn it over, the blade turns into a hook bill akin to a Karambit or Spyderco civilian. In the case of a bowie with a straight clip, such as a Bill Bagwell bowie, the knife would function as a worn cliff like a Spyderco Yojimbo. These blade shapes mean that during a back cut, the tip of the blade becomes the leading point of the edge. What that does is concentrate the force of your cut into a smaller area, increasing the pressure of your cut. An experiment to illustrate this is to take a balloon and press the front edge into it until it pops. Next, do the same thing with the back edge as if you were performing a back cut. You'll notice that the balloon pops much easier than before. It's also worth mentioning that because of this, the back edge doesn't have to be sharpened. A false edge on the clip is capable of doing a lot of damage simply by tearing through its target. That said, a sharpened edge is a more capable option. For those who claim that people weren't running around in the 1830s performing back cuts with their bowies, you are probably mostly correct. A great quantity of bowies were manufactured and most of the individuals who bought them as backup for their flintlock probably never spent much time learning how to actually fight with them. But just like every other weapon, there were those who learned how to use their knives effectively and it's extremely unlikely that they would not make use of such a capability. So let's take a closer look at the origins and history of the bowie. 
Let's start at the beginning, and that beginning is not James Bowie. What? The exact origins of the Bowie knife cannot be pinned down, nor does it likely have a simple single event that brought it into existence. What can be determined is that while his knife does carry his name, James Bowie did not create the Bowie knife. Let's take a closer look at the environment that led to the Bowie. Louisiana in the early 1800s was a mixing pot of culture, and with it, a southern fondness for dueling. It also gathered together masters of many different fencing schools. Schools from the French, Italian, and Spanish systems of fencing were numerous throughout New Orleans, teaching rapier, saber, and even broadsword. New Orleans' role as a major port also ensured that blades such as the naval cutlass and their use were prevalent. As of the 1820s, Louisiana did not have any neighboring states to its north or west, putting it directly on the frontier. As mentioned earlier, a large knife was more useful to a frontiersman than a larger blade, and so they were already commonplace, and certainly were influenced by the mix of blades and instructors in New Orleans. When looking at newspapers at the time, you will often see references to butcher blades in articles about knife fights. During this time period, a butcher blade was a colloquial term for any large fighting knife in addition to the modern use of this term. Then, in 1827, the infamous sandbar fight occurred. There are numerous conflicting eyewitness accounts of what happened, but what is known is that James Bowie killed Major Norris Wright with a large knife. This blade was instantly described as a butcher knife. As to what Jim Bowie's knife looked like is still a mystery. You can find numerous accounts describing the blade, almost all of which are of suspect credibility. The most likely account comes from Reason Bowie, who claimed, The first Bowie knife was made by myself in this state as a hunting knife for which purpose exclusively it was used by me for many years. The length of the knife was nine and a quarter inches. It's width one and a half inches, single edged and blade not curved. He also stated that he had loaned the knife to Bowie for self-defense after an attempt on his life prior to the sandbar fight. What happened to the original Bowie's knife is anyone's guess, so unfortunately we can't see exactly what the original Bowie knife was. The first confirmed account of a Bowie knife can be found in a letter from Nathan P. Ames of the Ames Sword Company to his brother James T. Ames in July of 1835 regarding a patent of a Bowie knife and pistol combination. After this, the number of references to Bowie knives begins to greatly increase. By 1837, it had become part of the U.S.'s popular culture. The term Bowie knife came to replace butcher knife, and any account referring to large knives abused this term. During this time, the first large-scale use of the Bowie knife in conflict took place during the Texan War for Independence. Bowies were used in the decisive Battle of San Jacinto in 1836 to make up for the lack of bayonets among Texan troops, further cementing its place in the West. While the Bowie is an American knife, it's interesting to note that many of the original blades were of foreign manufacture. Of particular interest is the Sheffield Knife Company, which produced Bowies in significant numbers for sales in the States. While the Bowie is associated with the South, these blades were imported and common everywhere. Foreign visitors were often disgusted with the sales of Bowies in the streets of Eastern cities, such as Philadelphia and Boston. This did little to slow the use of the knife, and large numbers of the blades were procured by volunteers in the Mexican-American War starting in 1846 and proved to be one of the most popular sidearms of the war. Multiple references are made to the mass use of the Bowies during multiple charges. Bowie knives from the war commonly bear engravings of slogans and mottos not to be confused with Civil War Bowies. After the war, the Bowie continued to make its way out west and was considered a necessary implement. The gold rushes in particular saw high numbers of Bowies. The California gold rush saw the rise of the San Francisco or California Bowie, which are highly sought by collectors. Another rush of import to the Bowie was the creation of the state of Kansas and the rush of pro-slavery and abolitionist settlers to the territory. Bleeding Kansas saw vicious conflict between the northern Jayhawkers and the southern border ruffians from 1854 to 1861. Bowies were a common arm of these bushwhacker fighters and shed their share of blood in the fighting. No less than the infamous John Brown carried a Bowie. That same Bowie was taken from him by future Confederate General Jeb Stewart while serving as an aide to Robert E. Lee during Brown's disastrous Harper's Ferry Raid. As Brown's Bowie helped to usher in the American Civil War, 
the Bowie helped to inflame the conflict. During the beginning of the war, large numbers of Bowies were purchased by volunteers, both Northern and Southern. Homegrown units were quickly raised and either issued non-regulation equipment or purchased it themselves. This was largely due to both sides being poorly prepared and stocked for war. Arms in the South were so short as to push several states to issue contracts for pikes and bowie knives. The majority of bowies at this time were hammered out at home or by the local bladesmen. Southern blades tended to be on the large side, so much so to become unwieldy. The famous Confederate D Guard also rose to prominence during this time, likely due to the short sword nature of these large Confederate bowies. While bowies undoubtedly saw action during the Civil War, the degree to which they were used in the fighting is unknowable, and they were likely more useful as camp implements. As the war progressed, they fell in demand, and fewer and fewer soldiers opted to carry them. This began to mark the decline of the Bowie knife. After the war, the advent of repeating cartridge firearms ultimately drove the Bowie to the background, although it remained a fixture of the West and retained its mythic status. The Bowie's history has been relatively uneventful since then until the beginning of a revival of interest in the knife. Individuals like Bill Bagwell, James Keating, and Thane Alexander have been working on developing not only the ideal Bowie, but the ideal Bowie fighting system. There is a lot more to the Bowie knife, and obviously not everything made it into this video or was simplified. If you have questions, hit me up in the comments below and I'll be happy to elaborate more. If you really are interested in learning more, let me recommend two books. The first, is Battle Blades by Bill Bagwell. This has several sections that describe the cutting performance of Bowies, their design, and their use. The second is the Bowie Knife Unsheathing an American Legend by Norm Flaterman. If you want the history of the Bowie, this is your book. I'll leave links to these books below. If you enjoyed this video, check out my video on the Indonesian Chris, or keep an eye out for an upcoming video on the Italian Switchblade. And as always, please consider liking and subscribing. Until next time, stay safe and keep living the knife life.